Yeah. <laughs> Hello there. Um, I think I'm streaming. I believe I am. Welcome to another uh, casual uh, lesson in songwriting today. Looking forward to our adventures. Today we're going to talk a little bit about... Um, let me get these out of here. I can look at you and read at the same time. Today we're going to talk a little bit about um, what great ideas are in titles. Um, and I'll explain more as, as we get into it. But first, I want to just kind of wait for a minute and let, let some people get online. And let's see, do we have anybody saying anything here? Let's see if we've got anybody talking to me yet. Um, I don't think so. We got a lot of donate. Learn more about creative events if it can apply. Okay. Good. I'll just wait for a minute and see. Uh, you know, when you get on, when you get on, uh, you know, just write me a little hello, and then I'll, just so that I know you're here uh, in the chat. It's chat dot restream. Uh, I guess you all know how to do that. I guess that is a question I need to ask Brett at some point to see if, in fact, that is what happens. Because there's are, there are certain things I don't know about yet. I'm still, still learning the ropes here. So uh, I need to ask how. Creative Vets. Okay. Oh, there we go. Mr. Two. Hey, dude. I'm assuming you're a, a guy because you said Mr. So, All right. Good to have you aboard. Uh, we'll just keep this handy in case I think of anything else that needs to be asked. Uh, let's see. I have a coffee somewhere. Oh, it's in here. There we go. Here's to y'all. This is my Christmas cup, but you know what? I want to be merry during this isolation thing. And so, uh, I'm just using this until we get it. And there's Seth. Hey, Seth. Good to see you. Uh, well, I don't see you, but good to have you on board. Uh, yeah, last last uh, episode we went through some lyrics. We were talking about the three basic tools of songwriters, which was a whole ton of fun. And uh, we didn't finish, we didn't go through that whole list yet, but I figured uh, we'd start off today with a new topic. Um, I'm waiting maybe for a few more people to get on board before we uh, kick in. Um, and uh, if, you're, if, you're, uh, if you're watching, um, get on the chat and say hello. Uh, let me ask, uh, either Mr. Two or Seth, uh, how do you get on that chat? Does the chat automatically show up when you get on, when you get into Creative Ets, uh, or do they have to go searching for it? And, and, you know, how complicated is it? Can you answer that question for me? Maybe. Yeah, the chat is next to your video. Oh, okay, good. So you just have to click on it and and then it goes. Good. Because uh, I don't think, I don't know if I've got the chat on mine or not. Um, 
I don't think I have a link to the chat. I have to go. To, I have to open it on. Uh, I have to open it on the on the intro nets separately. All right. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Oh, oh, no, no, not yet. I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, here's some song basics. Before we get into great ideas and titles, let's just talk about song basics. Um, basically, there's only two ways to tell a story, and that is either emotionally driven or story driven, right? And so that's not telling a story, but there's two ways to develop a song, two ways to lyrically develop a song. One is story driven and the other one is emotionally driven now with either one of those with either one of those you can have it symbolically represented such as i could write a song as a story song i could write a song i'm going to the big apple i'm going to take a bite out of the big apple down on you know down on uh, uh down on broadway or whatever, see? So that's a symbolic representation, but it is a real story. Uh, the, the other kind is an emo emotionally driven, right? Where we're saying, you know, you broke my heart, you know, or you're talking about your feelings. You're talking about um, concepts, emotions, feelings, yeah. Now, the reason why I bring this up is a good one. When you have a story to tell, you want to use a lot of detail. And this is important. You want to make sure you sprinkle in original details. It's very important, original details. You don't want to just use cliched lines over and over, no. Some of them, yeah, sure. You can, you can use cliches sparingly. But then you have to pop in some original stuff to keep people's attention. Clichés, of course, everybody knows them. And so people can relate to them because of that. But they can also bore people pretty quickly. So I try not to do use clichés very often. And in another episode, we can talk about how to deal with clichés. All right? Good. Um, at any rate, so you want, music is not as important. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Hosting. Portia to Center. Thank you for joining the, the party. Today we're going to talk about some basics, some song ideas and titles, right? Um... Last episode, we talked about the three songwriting tools, which was, of course, the biggest tool you've got, which I don't mention in this because it's, it's different, is, is your creative power, right? Your creative moment. That's your greatest tool is your imagination, right? But when you're in your, while you're in your imagination and you're in your creative space, you have three tools. The first one is original detail. The second one is contrast. The third one is rep, 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 repetition. Rep, 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 rep repetition. Yeah. So you have those th three things to work with. Those are the three basic tools. Uh, and if you go back to the previous thing, you'll see us going through some of the songs and talking about those tools and how we can see them being used in all these hit songs that we talked about. But right now, we're talking about story songs versus emotional songs. Um, so story songs, it's not as important. The music's not as important, right? Um, but it, but the details are important. Um, the next the next uh, style is is the emotional style. Now emotional songs 
emotionally driven songs don't need a lot of detail because you're you're often not always but you're often coming from a place of emotional of heightened emotion and I, I like to call it confessional like you're confessing something you're just coming out and saying something that you've been wanting to say and you're at, you're at heightened emotion so it's interesting the audience understands that you're in a state of heightened emotion and they forgive simpler lyrics with less detail. Now there are poetic emotional songs, absolutely. And that is, you know, that that is a wonderful thing. And we love it when we can add in our poetic um you know, uh, style to the song, but we don't have to. We can simply blurt out, say, you know, uh, I love you, I always will. You know, you are the sunshine of my life. You are the this and that. You know, it's very simple, right? Just clean, simple lyrics. So, and there can be some cliche lines in there because now we're dealing with just a simple confessional lyric, right? So how do we, how does an emotional song, which by the way is most songs on pop radio are emotionally driven, most songs are. Ed Sheeran being a great exception to that. Um, country songs, a lot of stories. They still stick to the stories, which I'm, I'm really glad about. I'm glad we have a, a bastion, a fortress, of storytelling still alive and well in country music. But uh, in pop music, we see a lot of emotional songs. So how, if the lyric is really simple, how are we gonna, how, how are we gonna keep the audience's attention? Well, it's very simple. Like if, I, if, if I'm gonna say, I will always love you. I mean, that's pretty boring, right? I mean, we, how many times have we heard that? Um, my, my guitar, which I love. Oh, oh, we had a little burp there, sorry. Claudia, Claudia, meet, meet the group. Okay. Um, so I will always love you, right? Uh, pretty, pretty mundane, you know, but we can go. I will always love you, yeah. I will always love you. So you get my drift? Music, very important in emotionally driven songs. Also, line rhythm, very important. Did you notice I mixed it up? I did not follow, this is important, listen up. I did not follow the natural line rhythm of that phrase. I will always love you. I will always love you, right? Da 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 da. I will always love you. A little feminine ending there. Love you. Love you. You get catch that? The last word, you, is unstressed. I, oh, let's start over here. I will always love you. Right? That's called a feminine ending. If it goes, I will, I will always love, oh. That's a, that's a masculine ending. But the minute you stick a little unstressed thing on the end, I will always love you. Ooh. So, 
we have to deal with that as well because feminine endings are have a lot of tension or they're funny they're they're one of two things they're either tense or funny so so I, rather than going i will always love you i went So repetition, changing the line length, in other words, the, uh, making it, forcing the, the, the line to be different. Um, I will always, I will always love you, yeah, yeah. I will always, I will always, I will always love you. See how I'm changing it up? I'm trying unpredictable ways of saying that simple line, right? I'm, I'm changing the line. I'm changing the natural line rhythm, stretching it, compressing it, stretching it, repeating certain words. Uh, you know, I will, I will always, mm, I will always love, mm, I will always love you, I, I will I will always, I will always love you. You know, that's where I was just taking the first word and then adding a second one, then adding a third one. All these are just all little, you know, just variations that I'm literally making up on the spot, right? So that's what, uh, so changing the line length, changing, um, you know, uh, also the, 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 the way you, uh, your rhyme scheme also can can make a seemingly when you read the lyric it seems pretty boring you can also change up the the, the rhyme scheme make it again a little unpredictable so unpredictable line length unpredictable rhyme changing it up a little bit um, interesting music the music should be should stand alone by itself without any lyric not so true with a story song. A story song can be a real simple, real simple, you know, like, a, you know, the, the, what you don't want to do is you don't want to distract the listener from the story with soaring music, right? Like, you know, uh, she walked in the bar, she walked in the bar room, looked in the mirror and started to cry. Or she walked in the bar room, looked at the man and started to cry. So she looked, she walked into the bar room, looked at the man, and boy, she started to cry. Now I got your attention because of the tear thing. But I, you know, but notice how distracting this can be. She walked in the bar and she looked at the man and started to cry see what i mean it's like it's it's harder to follow with all this fancy soaring complicated music it's much easier to um, and again i may have come up with something amazing and maybe i should have followed that you know because it, again every moment of creativity brings another, you know, idea of interest that you latch on to. But in general, in general, you don't want to have um, the music distracting from the story, from a story-driven song. Whereas in the emotional side, you want the music to stand by itself so that you can confess your simple lyrics. You know, when you're, when you're in a state of confession, 
you know, you can't, you can't necessarily think straight. And so the audience, again, forgives the simple lyric because you're just blurting out what's on your mind. You haven't thought about it. You're just emotionally just kind of barfing your, your, your feelings. And when you do that, the, mo the audience completely gets it. You know, they go, yeah, yeah, we get it. You're not going to be poetic. You're not going to add a lot of details because you're just confessing things. And again, you know, so, but if you do have those wonderful little poetic lines, then that's a sign of a, you know, of the style of writing that you like to do. And uh, so I try to, I personally try to add some, some poetic eloquence to my confessions, right? Try to do that. And, uh, but if you don't, it's okay. Just make sure your, your music's interesting, your line lengths are original, and your rhyme scheme is a little unpredictable and you'll have a you'll have a much better song that way um do you know um the word prosody well prosody is an important word and what it means is it means it's spelled p r o s o d like dog y prosody and it means the emotional marriage of the lyric and the music when they come together in perfection. So when I say, when I say, I will always love you, you know, you want it to be really, really, you know, like, I, I, I will always love, love, I will always love, love, love you. I started in the wrong key. I will always, there we go, love you. I will always love you. Yeah. You know, I, that feels like I will always love you. You know, uh, it'd be a whole different story, you know, it, 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 you know, uh, So that's what I call, that's what I call forced prosody, okay? And you know who did that and made a living on it? Where they put happy music to sad lyrics? Three guesses? Oh, thank you, Hypebot, Hypebot for uh, hosting. Thank you. Really appreciate that. Thanks for joining in. Glad to have you on board. Um, oh yeah, Mister um, Mister Two says uh, there's a, it, uh, it's just part of the streaming platform. Uh, oh yeah, for you to see it, right? Right. Okay, I need to open restream, but you don't. Okay, good. Thank thank you, Mister Two. Um, where was I? We were talking about um, uh, where? Oh, prosody. Yes, force prosody. <laughs> I get lost so easily. Help me. Uh, yeah, uh, Motown. Yeah, baby, baby, where did our love go? And inside me, and it hurts me so bad. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know what I'm saying? They made such a crazy killing on up tempo sad, up tempo music with sad lyrics, because in the '60s it was still the days of innocence, um, even though the Vietnam conflict was cranking up. Still back in America in the early 60s, in 64 and 65, um, yes, and you can do the opposite, yes. You can also do um, 
sad music to happy. You know, let me give you an example of that. Let's see. Um, um, it's happy hour. Everybody feels so happy. Happy hour. Happy hour all day. I'm so happy I'm grinning ear to ear oh, oh, oh. See what I mean? Hey, thanks for joining in. I got a bunch of people joining in here. Um, we got... Uh, Shai Latte. Shai Latte? Shai Latte is now following. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining in. So again, what are we learning here? What did we learn today? Right now, we just learned something. Right this very minute, we learned something. Music dominates lyric. How many times? Every time. I don't know why. It could be that music goes straight here. It bypasses the language, goes from the ear straight to the heart, right? Bypasses having to think about it. You feel it immediately. So whatever the music is, the music rushes in and gives you an emotion before the lyrics ever happen. And they hold that emotion with that with the music ongoing of course as it is it keeps being sad and it keeps being sad but yet the lyrics happy so what what do we have in that case we have the massive irony the massive irony that isn't it so ironic that the lyrics are so happy and the music so sad and that's part of what's keeping the audience's attention is that irony between the two. Yeah. So that's an interesting thing. Prosody is, is an interesting thing to play with. But if you want a song that sounds like your lyric, you want to do what they would call good prosody. If you want to purposely mess with your listener, then you can do a happy melody and chords to a sad lyric. The song will be ironically happy. There's no way to get around it. And they'll think, oh, you're just trying to dance your cares away like it was in the 60s, in the days of innocence after World War II and after the Korean War. People wanted to just, you know, I was there. I'm, you know, I was there, man. And everybody was just being happy and like, la, 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 la. We're just living this happy little life, right? The housewife with the little apron on, you know, and the little radio in the corner, and she's cooking spaghetti sauce, and uh, yeah, and he's off at some lovely little um, job, you know, uh, bringing home the money, and is, yeah, whatever. So uh, those were the days, and so I think Motown realized that because we're living in this little bubble of happiness. Why don't we take sad lyrics, which all teenagers are feeling, right? They're all feeling like freaked out because they're starting to become adults. And you know the story of teenagers. They're just a mess, right? They're a total mess. So they thought, well, why don't we just make, make this sad song danceable? We'll get it on Dick Clark. Oh, yeah. Dick Clark. Yeah, yeah. And so that's what happened there. Seth, hello, Seth. I see you You joined in there. That's great. Um, thank you for coming on board. Um, so that's what prosody is. Good prosody is when the lyrics and the melody emotionally connect with each other. So sad music to sad, right? And you'll hear when you're in co-writing sessions with the pros, 
they'll sometimes say that. They'll say, hey, this lyric is too happy or it's too sad for what we're doing. They're talking about prosody. They probably won't use the word prosody, but they're, you know, you might, you know, and this happens to me because, you know, I'm such a, I'll write a melody to a lyric and my co-writer will say to me, you know, it's a great melody, Rick, but, uh, you know, it's too happy for this uh, particular song. And I go, yeah, I don't want it to be happy. I want it to go up. And I change it. Yeah. And I, I only whine inside. They don't see me like this. They see me, oh, really? Okay. That's what I'm doing on the outside. On the inside, I'm going, yeah, you yeah, that's the little child in me getting his feelings hurt. <clears throat> okay, now, moving on. Let's talk about song ideas. Let's start off by saying, when do you know an idea is great? When do you know an idea is great? When do you know? Anybody going to chime in? I, I see there's people typing in 100%. Okay, so true. Okay, now, when you know when an idea, which can also be the title, you know when it, you know it's great when it's been proven out in the real world. Right? That's the only time you know it's great. Why am I telling you this? It's real simple. The reason why I'm telling you this is so that you will write all of your songs. Because we don't know. Sometimes we just don't know. We think, oh, here's a little ditty. I'm writing it on a Friday afternoon. I've had a beer. I'm feeling loose. The weekend's about to start. I don't want to be serious. I just want to write this little throwaway, this little ditty, this little nothing. Like, how about... Hey, right, Ethan, thanks for following. How about this, you know? How about this little ditty? Ba 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 he got me rocking and a rolling, rocking and a beat, ba 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 I mean, come on, man. Would you love to have the money from just that one song? Just that one song. Yeah, so that's my point, is you don't know a song's a hit until it's been proven out in the real world. So write all your songs. Write the silly little songs. Write the big songs. Write them all. It's important. Because we've talked about this. You've got two voices coming in. Every time you sit down to write, you have the voice that's the copy, which is all the songs you've heard before, including your own. Those are the copy. And then you have this other voice that's called that I call change the copy yeah it's sometimes hard to hear hard to hear but when you get used to hearing that voice you're gonna find you're gonna discover your originality that's where it is it's in that voice that says do something different try something new you know so if i go like ba 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 I just took that ba ba ba, and now we can change the words like, um, I will be forever yours. I will be forever yours. Oh, a little surprise chord in there. Yo. See what I mean? See what I mean? So, yeah, I don't even know what I was saying. I don't know where I was. Okay, we're talking about great song ideas. Um, 
I will mention something about uh, momentum. All songs need to have momentum. They need to be moving, right? If they're not moving, well, obviously they're standing still. Now, you can use an occasional standstill for effect, a very good effect. But for the most part, we want a song to move. There's only two ways a song can move. It can move forward with a story, with details, or it can move deep. Deep up, deeply happy, deeply in love, or it can move deep, you know, down sadness, anger. Yeah. So, if your lyric and your music aren't moving, either forward or deep, forward with, with story or deep with emotion, get rid of it. It's probably a red herring. It's probably something that doesn't need to be there. And again, I will say there's an occasional stop that's fun. You occasionally hear... You know, it's fun to punctuate your, your momentum with an occasional stop or an occasional drift. Uh, drift me meaning a diamond. Like a diamond is... These are diamonds. Where you strum and then let it ring. That's a diamond. So those are pauses, right? So pausing and then Yeah, those are stops. So stops and pauses, they're fun to throw in every now and then. But basically you want you want momentum forward or deep. Important. So if it's not doing that, get it out of there. Um, what are what is a great song idea? I mean, we we've talked about uh, a great idea, we know a great idea is, is a great idea after it's proven, but when it's proven, it'll have certain qualities. All successful songs have certain qualities. Let's talk about what those are. The first quality, very important, it'll have one, not two, one, Emotional idea, emotional message, one, not two. Two is too much. How long are most songs? How long are they? Three minutes? Four minutes? We don't have a lot of time to get this emotion across. So mixing up emotions, it's just, it, it, it's, it's going to wash out the main emotion that you're trying to get across. It's just going to wash it out. Now, there are some songs, there are some songs that have two. But there, it, it's really advanced songwriting to make a successful song where it has two, two themes. The song um, Remember Me has two themes. And you know who that is. That's the master. And my... The person that I look up to more than anybody in this entire town, that's Rodney Crowell. He wrote the song. And I think maybe the other master, um, um, the guy that wrote uh, The High Life with, um, I'll think of his name in a minute, uh, with, uh, with Woodward, Stevie, uh, Stevie Woodward. Uh, his name escapes me. But at any rate, Rodney Crowell is a master of songwriting and storytelling and singing and performing and being cool. He's the coolest dude around. And if you look up that song online, listen to it, and you'll see that it's saying, don't worry, life is going to be wonderful. I know that you're upset now, but hey, we all get upset where, you know, the, the wind's going to fill your sails. You're going to be great. And then he comes in with the slammer. Please remember me. And you're going, oh, oh. 
So that's really the underlying theme all along was, I'm saying all these wonderful things to you because I do believe them. But one of my main motivations in saying this to you is I'm really upset that you're having to leave me. You know, and so that's a great, you know, it's a great example of, and a very rare one, that there's two emotional themes in, in one song. But um, most of the time, one, okay? Now, let's talk about if it's a universal emotional truth. The next thing is the exact opposite. And these two go together and they're, and they're married, right? And that is an original, unique approach to that old-fashioned emotional message, right? A unique approach. And there's so many different ways to be unique. You can be unique melodically. You can be unique chordally. Is that a word? You can be unique lyrically. You can be unique with your line rhythm. You can be unique with your rhyme scheme. So there's all these different ways. You can be unique in your texture. You can use a Lithuanian nose flute, for instance. You weren't ready for that one, were you? Yeah, we'll see. Yeah. Oh, somebody likes me. Let me, let me turn off the sound here. This is too noisy. We want to turn that sound off. There we go. Somebody likes me. I don't know who it is. At any rate, uh, so... A unique approach to an old-fashioned emotion. That's the first thing that all hit songs have in common. The first two things. The next thing, it's singable. So when you're writing a song, be careful that you don't go wacko, you know, go two or two and a half octaves. You might be a really great singer, but don't out-sing the people you're pitching to. Now, I know... Um, Celine Dion, there are f people that are famous, uh, Justin Timberlake, there are people that are famous for Bob Dylan, famous for a mountain of range, right? Like his last song, Bob Dylan's song, I believe it's, it's a sparse little 17 minute number. Yeah, go online, check it out. It's the story of Kennedy's uh, assassination. And um, I believe it goes something like this. Yeah, yeah, one one note for seventeen minutes. One note. He's creating a mountain. I'm going to say I'm going to go K2, maybe even Mount Everest of tension in that song because it never changes. It's just... And Dylan has done this in the past where he'll uh, get a little lick going and he'll just keep it going and keep it going and going and then without changing. And it creates that hypnotic effect that just draws you in and at the same time creates a Mount Everest of tension in the case of a 17-minute song. Yeah, yeah. So, yes, the song must be singable. Memorable music? We've talked about this earlier. Uh, it depends. Yes, yes. Let's say yes, memorable music. But if it's a story song, the music may not be as memorable as the story itself. But that's okay. Still, the music must be good. The music must be enjoyable and completely relaxing to listen to from the list to the listener. The listener must go, oh, yeah, I love this. Yeah, yeah, I love this. You don't want any like, what? No, ah, you know, like... You can probably tell by the way I look and the way I dress that I'm not into death metal. Yeah, not into it. But for a death metal guy, 
They love it. They say, oh, I love that. That's me. Yeah, I relate to it. Wonderful. At any rate, uh, let's see, let me just check because I'm babbling on. Let me make sure that someone hasn't uh, said something to me and I've missed. I want to make sure I catch everybody. We've got things making sense. We've got uh, Mrs. Mrs. Uh, OEF5 came in and gave me some hearts. Thank you. Appreciate that. Yes, I do. And Mrs. is saying LOL. Good. Thank you. Uh, trying to keep it a little bit entertaining because, you know, this stuff is pretty dry. <laughs> pretty dry. But, you know, it, we can have fun with it, can't we? Yeah. So we're having fun. Or at least I am. <laughs> I hope you are, too. <laughs> okay. So where are we? Oh, yeah. Singable. Uh, the next thing that a, a, a song is going to be is a memorable music. And we've talked about that with a story. Maybe not as memorable as an emotional song. But yes, it needs to be, the music needs to be good. It needs to be good. Um, very important, a song must be honest, believable. It must ring true, right? Believable, ring true for that genre that it is. So what a country singer might say, and that rings true for them, might not ring true for a rapper out of Atlanta, right? Two different lifestyles, two different worlds that they live in, right? So, yeah, so that's something you got to keep in mind. Just remember, it's believable for the audience you're shooting for. And this is so important. Man, I'll tell you. The people in the business, you know, the producers, the A&R people, that's artist and repertoire, A&R, and they're, they work for the labels, and they find material for the artists. So the A&R people, the producers, the executives, the artists themselves, they have radar 14 miles long that can pick up a song that has just been made up out of nothing. So, you young writers just starting out, make sure that you write from the heart, that you write from what you know. Write a real story in your life or someone else that you know. And oftentimes it can be someone else you know. You know, our lives, my life isn't, you know, really all that interesting. But man, when I get with the artists and I listen to people and, you know, you can you can take a, a story off of a, off of a TV show, you know, um, like um, the marvelous Mrs. Maisel and her frustration of trying to be a comedian in New York. You can take that story and turn it into a song. That's a real story. That's a real thing. You saw it on the TV and it, it, it rang true to you. So you can use that. You can use stories out of out of books, plays, opera, TV, radio, blogs, you know. But you want to start with something you really feel is real. Start with reality. And then, and then, wait for it. Lie. Yeah. Go ahead and lie. But start from reality and then blow it up. Make it bigger. Make it more interesting. That's what we do. That's called imagination. Imagine that. Oh, there's imagination again. Imagine that. That's what we do. We imagine things, right? Yeah. Yeah. So it's... it's, it's it's a, it's a good thing. Start from reality and then lie. What did he say? He says, um, start with what you know, but don't let the truth get in the way of a good story. I know Harlan Howard said that, and I think he heard it probably from somebody like John Steinbeck, right? Or somebody like that, right? And John Steinbeck heard it from Jesus himself. 
I would not be surprised if he didn't have a direct connection up there. Yeah, he's a pretty cool dude. Um, what else does a, a great song have? Oh, it has, it has a, it has a, a casual um, conversational language. What I mean by that is, out of the 600,000 words in the English dictionary, there's only about, I'd say, maybe 200,000, maybe 100,000 words that are actual poetic, the words that sound good in poetry. So be careful that you don't throw in weird words, you know, in your songs. Keep it conversational. Keep the syntax the simplest it can be. Like, I, I, did, I wouldn't want to say, to the bar, I did go, unless I'm trying to write an Irish song. I turned the syntax around, I reversed it, right? I went to the bar. Keep it simple, all right? Now, you can be eloquent in your, in your conversation. You sure can. But it has, still has to have that conversational lilt to it, right? And you can tell it when you read lyrics of your favorite songs. You can see how it, it unfolds in a, in a simple, easy-to-understand way, right? Uh, very important. Um, another thing all hit songs have is masterful closure. You know, it's, you know, in the line of, in the, in the arc of a story, it can start and build and build and build, and then it can start to flatten out, and then it can blur, drop off, right? So, I always want to make sure that I don't let my listener down three quarters of the way through the song. I want to make sure that it still has the pizzazz after the last, you know, like during the last chorus or before the last chorus. That's what bridges are all about. That's what breakdowns are all about, which we'll talk about later in another episode. We'll talk about the different elements of a chorus song. We'll break that down for you. Um, so with all these things, with, with detail, repetition, and contrast, the three tools you have, take that imagination of yours and do a smattering of this. Just mix it all up and just see what comes out. But keep that arc of the storyline going up, 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 up. And then it'll drop just a little at the very end. All right? And you probably noticed that I have weird fingernails. That's because I have these painted on. It's a, it's a plastic stuff so that I can pick my guitar. So I apologize if these look kind of gross. That's what I gotta have because I strum down like Joni Mitchell. You know, um, I like to strum. You see how I'm going up and down? So I'm, I'm strumming this way and I used to I used to wear I used to wear um, the backs of my nails <laughs> wear them out not good uh, let's see doing a great job thank you thank you Mrs. Uh, OEF5 thank you OEF Mrs. OEF5 OEF5 maybe there's a funny way to say that that I'm not getting OEF5 OEF Five, oh, and the other thing, the other thing they'll all have is what we've talked about. They'll all have wonderful contrast. They'll also have repetition, contrast and repetition, along with their great details. Yeah, they'll have all that stuff. Now I'm looking at my watch and I see that it's two o'clock 
And I'm not sure there might be somebody coming on. Oh, your husband's a vet. Great. Yay. I was in Vietnam. 67, 68. Just before the Tet Offensive hit. The big surprise. Tet Offensive. Not good. And I was floating there off the Gulf of Tonkin, launching five missions a day. I was I was in the, I was the uh, guy in in central control with my sound powered headphones on, and I was telling those engine rooms, "Hey man, you got to get your RPMs up because we're launching aircraft, and if we don't have 32 knots of wind over the bow, those aircraft are going to crash in the ocean. So get going, crank it up." And so they would. And I'd see the dials on the wall and the RPMs would go up and then we'd see the knots. And we'd go, oh yeah, there we go, 32 knots. Believe it or not, an aircraft carrier that can hold, and I'm not kidding you this, they can hold three football games simultaneously with end zones. That's how big the flight deck is. Three football games simultaneously, including end zones. Yeah. That sucker will go 32 knots on a completely still day, which there was a lot of those in Vietnam. A lot of days where there just wasn't any wind at all. We had to get that damn thing going. And it would go. 32 knots, man. Think about it. I mean, I don't remember how many tons. I could look it up, but uh, it's a lot of a lot of metal. Six. We had 6,500 people on board. 65, of which 1,500 were people running the boat. Yeah, and the other 5,000 were running the airplanes. Can you imagine 5,000 men? I have no idea how many planes were on that thing, but I'm telling you, underneath the flight deck, the the uh, I can't remember what they call that deck, the deck that had all the planes all lined up. There were, there were maybe a hundred planes. I, 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 I can't remember. It's just, it's just, it was just packed with planes. All their wings folded up like this, right? Crazy, crazy. Two of them, two, uh, oh really? Two of my uncles uh, were with me. They were saying, oh, that's interesting. That's interesting. Um, I'm, I'm about to, I only have one friend left from the USS Ranger, CVA-61. Uh, let's see, where's some metal here? Got a piece of metal here? Oh, here's some metal. See this metal here? That's a capo. That could be the USS Ranger. They melted it down. It's gone. Boom. Gone. They took it out of mothballs for the Vietnam War. And after the war, they melted it down. It's gone. But wow, what a powerful boat it was. What a powerful boat. Um, let's see. Do we have anything else? Uh, same years. All right. Well, there you are. Yeah. Yeah. Same years. Was he in the Navy? Was He, he wasn't on the Ranger, was he? Was he on the USS Ranger? Because I got a yearbook that I just got. Check this out. I just got this in the mail from, from my friend, my only friend left. This is my cruise. All these pictures in here are from my boat. This is me on my ship. I didn't even know this thing existed. I don't know why, but I never heard about it. And when I got in touch with my friend and had lunch with him uh, out in LA when we were writing, because uh, I'm a songwriter and I was in LA and I was my visiting my friend, David Caesar, and David said, I, I've got this book I found in the attic. You might be interested. 
it's a, it's the yearbook of our cruise. And I went, what? Yearbook of our cruise? What are you talking about? He says, oh, yeah. Got this book. Let's see if I can show you a picture of this monstrosity. Uh, I mean, you cannot believe the size of this thing. Look at the size of this thing. Yeah, that was me. Yeah, unreal, unfreaking real. So, yeah, there's that. And where were we? Oh, um, let me just see. Uh, they were both army. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Army. Ooh. That was that was rougher duty than what I had. I'll just tell you that right now. As they said in the in the movie uh, on Golden Pond. Um, What's her name said to Henry Fonda? He said, uh, how do I look, Martha? Henry Fonda says to uh, uh, Audrey, uh, uh, Catherine Hepburn, uh, I feel good. And, and she says, not good, Norman, not good. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so we've had that expression in our household, not good, Norman, yeah. Being out there in the jungle, oof, that had to be the roughest damn duty that ever, ever, ever existed. You know, when you, when you see that movie, uh, Heavy Metal, was it uh, Heavy Metal Jacket? And then uh, what's the other one that was so good about the jungle stuff? Um, oh, there was a couple of them. There was a Apocalypse Now and then another one. But anyway. You, you going through this jungle and there could be some, you know, a Vietnam soldier <coughs> literally two feet away from you and there'd be no way to know it. It was, it was pretty, it was pretty, uh, it was pretty awful over there. Full metal jacket. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, full metal jacket. Aye. And then the, the most famous one was, uh, what was it called? Um, platoon brain still works. Anyway, enough of this uh, nostalgia.